For those of you who, uh, if you missed it, there's a piece in today's Science Times, New York Science Times, called A Neuroscientific Look at Speaking in Tongues. And the, uh, the headline above the, um, the fMRI scan says, Evidence for a Religious State. So I mentioned that to you. You might want to take a look at it. It's the work of Andrew Newberg. And it, uh, one of the commentaries does say that uh, it's not clear what the finding says, but I'm just bringing it to your attention as a, as a, as a matter of interest. Um, we're going to go into the morality issue, some of the morality issues this morning. Um, um, and we'll be hearing from Sam, from Jim Woodward, from Mel Connor um, um, initially. And then we have some words from Richard Sloan later. We have uh, Paul Churchton to emulate Dan Dennett. So if people could keep to um, the shorter time scale, that would be excellent, and that would move us along quite quickly. Uh, I'd like to start with a, with a brief clip from um, The Root of All Evil, which is Richard's, uh, Richard Dawkins' movie that was shown in England a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Rich, we actually talk, we were originally talking about um, showing this here. Uh, but in the interim period, it's, it's all over YouTube and everywhere else and so on. So it's, it's, it's widely available, although it wasn't necessarily intended to be. But I do want to see this, I do, do want you to see this clip to begin with. So let's just watch this. We just had a rather disconcerting experience. We were just packing up our stuff ready to go, and he suddenly drove up in his pickup truck and said, get off my land immediately, I'll have you thrown in jail, and I'll have seize your film. And he then said a very curious thing. He said, you called my children animals. Afterwards, we worked out that what he must have meant was that I talked about evolution. He thought I was saying that his flock were animals, which, of course, in a sense, I was, because all humans are animals. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I thought you might just like to see that um, in terms of a few uh, foundational ideas in terms of humility and piety and morality and so on and so forth. So um, let's start this session off. I don't want to comment any more on that. We can go into it later if you want to. But let's start this session off with um, Sam Harris, um, who has been introduced already. But as I said before, the best-selling author of uh, most recently Letters to a Christian Nation. Thank you, Roger. Well, I want to uh, try to focus us again on this question of uh, the relationship between morality and religion. Because I, I think, as I said before, I really think this is the, the keystone myth in our society that keeps religion in such good standing among otherwise rational people. Um, and, and so I really think this is the, the place where science should apply uh, pressure even more so than on, on questions of evolution and, and um, uh, other obvious points of conflict. Uh, and this is, it's, it seems to me quite simple. I mean, this is not, the argument here is not complex. This is not rocket science. Uh, but paradoxically, it's, it, I mean, it's both easier than rocket science and harder. It's easier because there's nothing complicated, really, that needs to be understood uh, to, to run the argument that we don't get our, our uh, morality out of religion. But it it is harder than rocket scientists, apparently, rocket science, apparently, because you can rather often find rocket scientists uh, who don't see uh, that we don't get our, our morality out of religion. Uh, so it's it's a it's a problem of discourse. I think it's a problem that that certain ideas in uh, remain in good standing and remain immune to criticism. Now, previously, I spoke about the problems that beset any claim that that. Uh, re any religious doctrine is true. Um, these being that, that if religion really were a, a genuine branch of, of intellectual inquiry, it would function by the same rules. We, we would have people's certainties about their religious doctrines scaling with the evidence 
and the arguments that could be marshaled in support of those ideas. And, and we, f we fundamentally find that that's not what's going on in religion. Uh, so briefly, my argument on that subject is that uh, where we have reasons for what we believe, we have no need of faith. And, and where, we, where we don't have reasons or we have bad ones, uh, we, have, we have really lost our connection to the world and to one another. Uh, and, and here I'm not talking about faith in the sense that Paul Davies was talking about, the faith that the sun is going to rise tomorrow or the faith, the faith that the, the laws of nature are in some sense uh, rationally apprehendable. I mean, this is, I'm talking about faith in, the, the faith which allows people to accept gratuitous uh, and very specific claims about the way the world is. The, the, the universe is 6,000 years old, a book is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, etc. Uh, but there, there's another way that religious people rise to the defense of God that has nothing to do with claiming that their religious doctrines are true. Uh, the claim, rather, is that the re religious doctrines are useful. Uh, and uh, the way they're imagined to be most useful is, is in providing a foundation for morality. The claim really is that religion makes people moral. And the fear uh, on the part of uh, millions of religious people in this country, not just people like Ted Haggard, but, but far more moderate people, uh, is that without faith, we will lose something essential to us in the moral sphere. We will lose uh, any purchase upon durable reasons to treat one another well, uh, to find meaning in our lives, and we'll just be we'll just plunge into some kind of state of nature where where selfishness and and, and the, the purest creaturely antagonisms will be the norm. Uh, there's a political version of this morality claim, which is that our, our, our society has been founded on Judeo-Christian principles, uh, and the implication being that without these principles, there'd be no way to write just laws. Uh, so this is, this is ubiquitous, as you all know. Uh, the first thing to point out is that it, it should be rather obvious to everyone that we can find reasons to treat other human beings well, uh, to help them in times of suffering, that don't require uh, that we believe anything preposterous about the nature of the universe. We don't have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin to help people. Uh, and I think, it's, uh, I think perhaps Richard pointed this out, it is rather more noble to help people purely out of concern for their suffering than it is to help them because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it or will reward you for doing it or will punish you for not doing it. Uh, so the problem, one problem with this linkage between religion and morality is that it actually gives people bad reasons to help other human beings when good reasons are available. And I, I think this, this has to be pointed out. Uh, now, the, the idea that we get our morality out of, our, out of religion begins to look immediately suspect when you actually read the books, and this has also been pointed out. Harry Croto pointed this out, I believe, and as did Richard. Uh, you know, you, you, the truth is that not even fundamentalists like Haggard can take the God of the Bible at his word, given how sadistic he is in certain books of the Bible, like the Leviticus and Deuteronomy and... Uh, Exodus and Second Samuel. I mean, this is the, the, God is just so the, the, the vision of life that is preached uh, in those books is so needlessly horrible. It is so um, uh, hostile to the ba to, to to creating a, a sustainable society where where basic human happiness is uh, is even possible. That if you're going to draw your to do list out of a book like Leviticus, you're going to make Mullah Omar of the Taliban look like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I mean, this is just not, this is a, this is not a vision of life that even our fundamentalists subscribe to. Uh, so they have, even our fundamentalists have, have effectively edited the Bible by their neglect of many of its passages. Uh, and so, and how do we do this? Well, we edit the Bible based, we cherry pick it based on our own intellect, our own ethical intuitions and a larger conversation about ethics and, and human happiness that has developed in the last 2,000 years. Uh, I believe Pat Churchland also pointed this out. I mean, so we, when we go to the Bible and we see that a moral precept like the golden rule is a brilliant distillation of, of some of our ethical impulses, we, we do that on the basis of, of 
our own intuitions uh, and this larger conversation, and then we reject the barbarism. And this is, so, so our, our own ethical wisdom is the guarantor of the wisdom we find in the Bible. And this also, I think, has to be pointed out to religious people. And as Richard pointed out, there's no question that our, our morality precedes our humanity even. I mean, we, we have experiments where mice are shown to be more disturbed at the suffering of familiar mice than unfamiliar mice. We know that, that monkeys will uh, withstand painful shocks to, to uh, or will, will uh, withstand starvation to keep their, their cage mates from receiving painful shocks. We know that chimpanzees show obvious concern over, over uh, uh, fairness in the allocation of food rewards. I mean, these are the kinds of findings you would expect if our morality were somehow an emergent property of, of biology. Uh, but let me tell you what, briefly what, uh, what I think is most wrong with this linkage between religious, uh, religion and, and morality. Uh, and this, I think, gets to some of Joan Roughgarden's concerns about how we can have a, a, a generalizable morality that is uh, uh, based on reason, that, is, that doesn't plunge us into any kind of moral relativism. Uh, it seems to me that the only rational basis for morality is a concern for human and animal suffering, that for the suffering of conscious beings. If we, if we could build computers that we thought were conscious, we would have moral obligations to them as well. Insofar as a system can be ma made happy or be made to suffer, we have moral obligations toward that system. Uh, and this is why we don't have moral obligations toward rocks, because we don't think there's anything we can do to make rocks suffer. Um, and this makes sense of why we have gradations of our moral concern. If it is right to be more concerned about the experience of a chimpanzee, for instance, than the experience of a cricket, it is right because the, the complexity of a chimpanzee nervous system is a, it, it provides more of an opportunity for happiness or suffering. Uh, so those gradations that we, I think we have some very serviceable moral intuitions about, about what, who to worry about in the world, in the animal world, and, and uh, this makes sense of why we, je we tend to privilege uh, human beings over uh, most animals. The problem with religious, uh, with a religious foundation uh, for morality is that religious conceptions of right and wrong systematically separate questions of morality from the living reality of human and animal suffering. Religious people tend not to focus on suffering and happiness. This is why we have a nation that can debate gay marriage as though it were the great moral issue of the time, when genocide and, 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 and massive forms of suffering are occurring on a daily basis. Um, I'll give you a case in point that I brought up briefly yesterday. This, this, uh, uh, the fact of stem cell research, as many people in this room no doubt are aware, stem cell research is one of the most promising lines in, in biology to generate medical therapies. Uh, and it is not being funded at the federal level uh, for reasons that are religious, but for re because, because we have this idea that, based on uh, rather vague uh, notions of theology, that in every fertilized ovum there is a soul. And you can't privilege the, the interests of one soul over another, even if one is in a Petri dish and the other is in a, a man with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, it's, a lot has been said in this conference about science not being able to answer questions of morality. Well, I think this is a question of morality that science has answered. Uh, if you look at the details, if you look at the, the human embryos that are destroyed in stem cell research, uh, what is a three-day-old human embryo? It is a collection of 150 cells. Uh, that may sound like a lot of cells to, 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 to lay people, it does, but there are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Uh, now, we, it seems to me, if, if our concern is about suffering in this universe, uh, it is rather obvious that we should be more concerned about killing flies than about killing three-day-old human embryos. Now, this, this may sound like a very provocative claim, I would argue that it shouldn't if you look at the details. Now, many people, of course, will argue, well, the difference between a fly and a three-day-old human embryo is that a, a, a three-day-old human embryo is a potential human being. Uh, 
this runs into problems. Every cell in your body, given the right manipulations, every cell with a nucleus, is now a potential human being. I mean, literally, every time you scratch your nose, you have committed a holocaust of potential human beings. Uh, so the, the argument for, for a cell's potential doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, but let's, let's take this a little bit further. Let's say we granted that every three-day-old human embryo has a soul worthy of our moral concern. Uh, there are other problems that await this, uh, this uh, description. First of all, embryos at this stage can split into what we call identical twins. Uh, now, is this a case of, of one soul splitting into two souls? Embryos at this stage can fuse into what we call a chimera. There are many people in this room could have developed in this way. Now, I, I suspect that there are theologians trying to figure out what has happened to the extra human soul in such a case. Uh, it, it's time we realize that this arithmetic of souls doesn't make any sense. It's intellectually indefensible, but it is morally indefensible, given that these notions really are prolonging the scarcely endurable misery of tens of millions of human beings. And because, uh, because of the respect we accord religious faith, not even just people of faith, even advocates of stem cell research uh, accord this the, the faith respect, uh, we can't have this, this dialogue uh, in the way that we should. So I submit to you that if, if you think that the 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 interests of a blastocyst, a three-day-old human embryo, just may trump the interests of a little girl with spinal cord injury or, or a person with full body burns. Uh, your moral intuitions have been obscured by religious metaphysics. Uh, and this is a kind of blindness that is very well subscribed in our society. And it's a blindness that goes by another name. It goes by the name of religious faith. And we have been cowed into respecting it. So in conclusion, I just want to point, up and point out another issue. Uh, I want to return to this question of truth and the truth of religious doctrine because it's interesting to notice that even if we got our morality out of religion, even if religion was supremely useful, this would not be an argument for the existence of God. I mean, just, just imagine. Imagine if atheists were really reliably immoral and religious people were, the, were uh, exquisitely moral. Would this argue for the specific truth of Christian doctrine or the doctrine of Islam? Faith can, could function like a placebo. The idea of God could be perfectly vacuous and yet incredibly useful. I think there's much evidence to suggest that it's not. But even if it were, this is not a, an argument for the truth of religious doctrine. And this is, this is surprisingly hard for people to see. Uh, and it is amazingly easy to see when you change the subject from God to some ordinary proposition. I mean, just imagine if I claim that I'm, a, uh, I'm one of the fastest people who has ever lived, and I could have won many Olympic gold medals uh, in track and field had I only tried. Uh, now, if you ask me why I believe this about myself, uh, uh, well, let's, let's say I maintain this even in, contrary to the evidence, even in the company of, of Olympic sprinters who can run circles around me. Uh, you ask me why I believe this. What if I said things like, well, uh, being the fastest man alive has brought me immense satisfaction? Or what if I said, uh, you know, that the, winning a gold medal in the Olympics is one of the highest human honors, and just imagining those medals around my neck uh, just, just makes me feel uh, fantastic and gives my life meaning? It, it's pretty clear what is wrong with these answers. I mean, this is the... the the fact that it would be nice if something were true, or the fact that believing it to be true gives you positive, some positive effect in your life is not a reason to believe that it is true. And we readily understand this in every area of our lives. And this is why we have phrases like wishful thinking and self-deception and delusion. And so my argument to you uh, across the board is that a person who believes that an invisible and all-knowing deity is taking an interest in their lives and occasionally doling out good fortune to them should not be free to say that he believes this because it gives his life meaning, because it makes him a better person, 
because he values the experience of going to church on Sunday. These are, these are non sequiturs. Uh, and so just in conclusion, I want to say that I, I think we, we have to acknowledge that, that these two approaches to morality really are in competition. Either we can focus on questions of human happiness in a, in a very fine-grained way, bringing all of uh, the last 2,000 years of human insight and human discourse to bear, uh, and have a 21st century conversation about morality, or we can have a conversation born of the first century as preserved in the New Testament, or the seventh century as preserved in the Quran. And it is amazing how many intelligent people find this to be a difficult choice. Uh, the challenge for us is to, is to really expose time and again that the choice is that. The, cho we, the, the opportunity is for human conversation. And it can either be modern uh, with everything useful brought, brought on the table, or it can be fixated in the past out of deference to certain books. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
uh, publishing those those cartoons, and New York Times wrote editorials, you know, about about it. And we're not recognizing uh, the bigger picture here, which is uh, these these are this is an, an eruption of medievalism that is sanctioned by the, the fastest growing religion in the world. And here again, I'm I'm focusing on Islam. Uh, uh, almost randomly, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about religion in totality, but uh, it's, it, you have to get, if you're going to dignify the claim that one of our books is not just a book, but is in some sense an infallible document, you are, it seems to me, always gonna be held hostage to the contents of the book. And, and it just so happens that these books are, are, are engines of intolerance. I mean, you just, you know, 100 years from now, someone can pick up the Quran or the Bible and find reasons to be every bit as obnoxious as Ted Haggard or worse, uh, and those reasons are continually refreshing themselves. So unless we undercut this notion that the Bible and the Quran are not at all like the plays of Shakespeare, uh, I just th I don't think the problem can go away. Yeah, I'm going to have to be an engine of intolerance because yeah. I'm hostage to time, so... Um. Okay, well, well uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, so as Roger said, I'm primarily a philosopher of science, and I have some interest in um, uh, moral decision-making and the mechanisms that underlie moral decision-making. I'm not an expert at all on the relationship between science and religion. And in fact, I'm afraid that I haven't read a number of the books that are being discussed at this conference. But um, what I, I have been uh, listening to what's been said, and I've, I've had certain... Um, uh, reactions, uh, and one of my main reactions has just been surprise at some of the things that are being claimed. And I wanted to begin just by saying a little bit about that, and then I'll uh, segue into the uh, a very brief uh, sort of moral philosophy part of the talk. So um, in, in the past couple of days, I've heard uh, the following claims, and I'm caricaturing slightly, but uh, uh, here they are. Uh, there's the claim that God doesn't exist. Uh, there's the claim that belief in God or religious faith or perhaps particular religious doctrines are responsible for all sorts of bad outcomes that we don't like, like uh, suicide bombing or interference with scientific research. And then uh, there's the at least implicit suggestion it's a good practical workable strategy to try to ameliorate these bad outcomes by converting the world to secular humanism. Um, so the thought is that there's something like a straight line from I, I take it from those three propositions, from one to two to three, the thought, I guess, is something, uh, you can explain to me if I'm wrong about this, that religious faith is irrational, irrationality, of course, is bad, and this badness in belief leads to badness in action. So we have, boy, a real simple, straightforward explanation of why there's suicide bombing. Um, now, I'm an atheist. Uh, I've been an atheist since about, I grew up in a religious family. Uh, but have been an atheist since about age 10, uh, very unapologetic about it. But I don't think that the truth of atheism uh, generates uh, answers by itself to those claims two and three. Instead, very specific uh, empirical evidence is required. Now, about two, uh, the claim that um, um, religious faith or particular religious doctrines uh, lead to um, the various bad outcomes that we've been talking about, well, I think there are just some basic uh, sort of methodological points here that need to be made. Um, I think, I, I, I mean, I, this is one of the things that frankly surprises me about this con conference, is that you should bring to claims like two um, the ordinary scientific standards of evidence and assessment that you would insist on in other contexts. And I'm afraid I haven't seen much of that uh, uh, at this conference. Um, a general point is I think if you have something that is varying, like the incidence of suicide bombing, I mean, 50 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was relatively little uh, suicide bombing. 100 years ago, uh, I suppose, uh, though I'm not very informed about this, uh, uh, I would assume less. Uh, you can't, I think, very adequately explain this variation in incidence by appealing to something that's constant, like the content of the Quran. And I don't think either it's a very good explanation. It isn't something that would be um, accepted by any very um, thoughtful social scientist, uh, simply to appeal to what the bombers themselves uh, say. You've got to find factors that um, co-vary uh, with uh, those who are or are not suicide bombers, and you need to formulate and exclude 
uh, alternative hypotheses. So it's not good enough just to have the hypothesis that say, uh, the content of the Quran is responsible for uh, suicide bombing and pile up all sorts of evidence, say by quoting the Quran and quoting the suicide bombers themselves, uh, in support of this, you need to think about what the alternative explanations would be and you need to systematically exclude these. Now, my, I'm not very far from being an expert, uh, of course, on suicide bombing, but my intuition would be that all sorts of local factors facts about particular uh, political actors, uh, particular historical contingent uh, events are going to be better explanatory variables than uh, just appealing to the content of these people's uh, religious faith. And I would assume that the same thing is true for the rise of the Christian right. Um, there's no question that we're undergoing uh, throughout the world uh, what looks like a sort of rise in um, religious fundamentalism. It's, there's no question that it's disturbing, alarming, etc. But I think that what we need to do is to try to understand the particular social and economic and political factors um, that are responsible for this. Um, we need to understand the, uh, uh, the choices that various uh, opportunistic political figures have made uh, to um, uh, encourage this sort of, sort of thing. And I think that's a better, uh, a better strategy for really understanding what's going on and effectively dealing with it than um, uh, simply uh, sort of fulminating against uh, uh, religion in general. So what about three? Uh, just to remind you, three is it's a good strategy to try to ameliorate the, these bad outcomes we don't like by uh, converting the world to secular humanism. Well, I have a couple of things to say about this. Uh, first of all, good luck. Uh, there's, uh, you know, like what planet are you guys living on? Uh, this just isn't going to happen. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's an empirical assumption here, and the empirical assumption is that uh, the secular behave better than the religious. And as far as I know, um, there's no serious evidence for this claim. Um, for all of the uh, bad things that come out of religion, one can uh, cite on the other side, uh, Hitler, Stalin, uh, Mao, Pol Pot, uh, uh, et cetera. These were secular regimes. They also did uh, terrible things. Um, I've heard it claimed at this conference that nothing good or morally worthwhile has come out of religion. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but uh, I think it's simply an empirical fact that, for example, the civil rights movement uh, in the United States uh, drew heavily on uh, religious inspiration. Uh, if you look at the history of the uh, abolitionist movement, both in the United States and in uh, Britain, you'll find uh, religious figures and religious arguments uh, figuring centrally uh, in that. So that's just an empirical fact. And, um, you know, as, as scientists, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't deny it. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I think in some sense that if the causes of the kind of behavior that we don't like are local in particular, this is good news because it makes the problem more tractable. Uh, we can try to address these. Uh, we can't, uh, if, if the solution to the problem requires that we somehow engineer the end of religion, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think the situation genuinely is pretty hopeless. So I hope that that uh, absolutely isn't true. Um, in general, I think a better strategy for trying to um, deal with these, the issues, the, the, the sort of political and moral uh, uh, fallout of um, uh, religious belief, political and moral fault that we don't like, uh, a better strategy is to try to better understand the psychological mechanism that underlie admirable and immoral behavior, and which I would assume are shared alike by both believers and uh, the secular. So that's the first part of my talk, and I'm sorry if I sounded a little polemical, but uh, I really do think that, that um, the importance of approaching these questions about, you know, it's one thing to argue about the existence of God. You can, people make all sorts of a priori philosophical arguments one way or the other about that. But when you come to these questions that I called two and three, these are empirical questions, and they have to be invest, addressed in a responsible um, empirical way. Okay, so in the second part, good without God, can we be good without God? Uh, again, I would emphasize this is an empirical issue, can't be resolved a priori or by intuition, but I, are, I do think there are grounds for cautious optimism. Um, after all, um, cooperative behavior uh, presumably has been a feature of uh, behavior in the human species uh, since uh, the origins of Homo sapiens, it greatly antedates uh, the uh, monotheistic religions. This certainly suggests that we don't need these religions 
uh, for uh, cooperative or moral behavior. Uh, the decline of religious belief in Western Europe, this is already something that's been um, uh, mentioned uh, over the last century, it certainly has not been accompanied by any great explosion of immorality. Uh, again, this is uh, grounds for cautious optimism. There's a long philosophical tradition of putting morality on a non-religious basis. Um, just in the early modern period, you have Hobbes, you have Kant, sort of, although people argue that uh, really Kant is just uh, you know, the categorical imperative and so on is really just uh, uh, re a certain set of uh, Protestant religious ideas uh, uh, redis redescribed in another kind of language. You, but you also have figures like Mill and Rawls who are certainly secular. Um, th these, so there's a, a, a long-standing sustained intellectual attempt to uh, put um, religious, uh, to put morality on a, on a secular, non-religious basis. Um, and I think there's some, although philosophers like to focus, perhaps understandably enough, on the points at which the moral uh, recommendations of these different approaches diverge from one another. I think if you, <coughs> if you look at the larger picture, uh, you see a great deal of convergence on what's recommended. You know, ideas about <coughs> Human rights, human equality, etc., uh, figure in uh, all, all of these uh, uh, all of these figures. Um, I think the weakness of uh, conventional uh, uh, moral philosophy, including these great historical figures, is uh, the absence of any convincing motivational story or a realistic psychology uh, to go along with the normative um, uh, pronouncements that they make. So, uh, you know, Kant uh, suggests, for example, that you should. Uh, uh, the, the, the only action, or at least the, the kind of action that has greatest moral worth is action done for the sake of the moral law uh, in itself. Very unclear what this means. What does this really translate into in terms of facts about human motivation? Uh, a certain kind of utilitarian uh, suggests that we should be um, unconditionally uh, 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 altruistic all the time and act directly for the greatest good of the greatest number. Uh, it seems dubious that, act, that actual real life human beings have any such motivation. So I think what's missing in the, um, the traditional uh, approach is, as I say, a realistic psychology. And I think this is one of the points at which um, uh, empirical information and informed uh, empirical investigation about morality uh, can really be uh, quite uh, helpful. So just, just to say it again, uh, uh, in a slightly different way, um, one, one of the things one can do with empirical research is to ask the question of what sorts of motivations and preferences do human beings in fact have. And one, I take it, long-standing um, worry uh, that people have had, and I've even heard it expressed at this conference, is that without religion, um, people would behave in an entirely uh, selfish way. They would behave uncooperatively uh, when, it, when it is to their advantage uh, to do so. And this, of course, raises the question of um, what sorts of preferences, motivations uh, do people uh, uh, actually have. And in fact, there's a substantial amount of, uh, of um, evidence coming out of uh, uh, the, the kinds of experimental games that are uh, investigate, investigated in uh, experimental economics uh, that people do have uh, non-self-interested preferences. So for example, uh, people cooperate even in one-shot games um, when uh, defection is the dominant strategy. Um, even when the uh, self-interested thing to do would be to defect, even when you don't, it's not a repeated game, so you don't get the kind of repeated effects, um, the, 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 the kinds of effects on reputa reputation, reciprocal altruism, et cetera, that would be uh, present if you had a, a repeated game. They cooperate uh, even under conditions of anonymity, uh, et cetera. I think it's a really interesting uh, empirical question what the structure of the preferences are that uh, account for this behavior. And I think it's something that we don't understand very well uh, at this point, and that would also relatedly what the, what the underlying neural mechanisms are. But that the behavior itself is not um, entirely self-interested seems to be, um, uh, to me, um, the, the, the empirical uh, evidence seems to be really clear. And, and uh, just to mention one piece of work uh, of, of a more neurobiological sort um, uh, in this context, um, Rilling and others uh, recently did the following. They uh, imaged um, uh, human subjects in a sequential prisoner's dilemma. That is, the first player moves, and then the first player moves first, and the second player knows what the first player's move is. Okay, so um, certainly if people are entirely self-interested, the dominant strategy um, is to defect. Um, 
in um, imaging uh, uh, investigations, you see when the, when the uh, first player moves cooperatively and you image the second player, uh, uh, you see, and the second player also cooperates, uh, you see um, uh, activation in standard reward areas of the brain, like the dorsal striatum. And interestingly, you get more activation when the player is playing with a human partner than, with the, than when the player is playing with a computer, even though the reward is the same in both cases. And what this seems to strongly suggest is that people are, so to speak, getting independent utility from the fact that they're cooperating with another human being. And I think this is uh, encouraging news. So, uh, to the extent that people, this, is, this should be non-self-interested preference, preferences, to the extent that people have non-self-interested preferences, we need to understand better what the structure of these preferences are. Uh, to what extent are people unconditional or altruists? To what extent are they conditional cooperators? And if they are conditional cooperators, uh, what sort of conditional cooperators are they? May make a great deal of difference it, whether they're the kind of conditional cooperator who um, begins with the assumption that the other player is going to defect and only plays cooperatively if one has reason to believe that the other player is going to play cooperatively too. That would be one possibility. Another possibility is that we're wired up in such a way that, at least in a lot of cases, we think the default strategy is to cooperate. We only stop cooperating if we see the other person uh, is not cooperating. So the structure of these preferences, I think, is really quite crucial to understanding, um, get, getting a sort of a realistic understanding of the motivational uh, kind of bases that, that we have. And, and, and that, in turn, uh, I think is really our, our best hope for devising moral and political theories that are actually workable and rest on uh, realistic assumptions about human behavior. Uh, in addition to these the general questions of what kinds of preferences do we have, there are very interesting questions about the conditions that elicit uh, the preferences. There's very interesting questions about the distribution of, of the preferences across the population. Obviously, people are not all the same. Some people are more self-interested than others. Uh, all of these are things are uh, all this is information that is, I think, um, highly relevant to um, moral and political decision making. And um, uh, there's really beginning to be a very uh, rich body of, uh, uh, of research about it. Now, w in, w whenever one talks about the uh, possible relevance of empirical information to uh, moral and political theorizing, um, well, of course, the question that's always raised is, what about the yawning gap between is and ought? Uh, you can't derive uh, an ought from an is. And I'm certainly not claiming, for example, that we can decide whether uh, uh, abortion is moral or immoral by doing an experiment of some kind. But as I've already, I think, somewhat illustrated, uh, empirical information can be relevant to moral decision making in other ways. Uh, it can provide information about what the motivational constraints are. You don't want your moral and political theory to rest on assumptions about the motivations that people have, uh, where those, where those uh, assumptions are just empirically false. Uh, empirical information uh, about the experience of those who live with a moral practice and its consequences uh, can be certainly highly relevant to moral decision making. Uh, we talked uh, very briefly about torture um, uh, in this connection yesterday. Um, abolition, the, the abolitionist movement is uh, highly uh, I think instructive in this connection too. Uh, yesterday, uh, Susan uh, uh, Neiman challenged us to say, well, uh, what is it that's actually empirically learned when um, uh, it was decided that uh, slavery is a bad thing? Well, if you look at the history of the abolitionist movement, lots of things were empirically learned. Uh, for example, one of the things that was decisive, as I understand it, in uh, persuading the uh, British uh, government and the British public to um, uh, end uh, British involvement in the slave trade was simply empirical information about the kinds of conditions under which slaves were being uh, transported and the enormously high uh, death rates, uh, et cetera, the incredibly uh, cramped and filthy conditions, et cetera. So I think that um, uh, moral decision making, when it's uh, uh, good moral decision making, is going to be uh, informed at every point with um, uh, empirical information. Now, finally, um, there's been some talk at this conference about the idea of putting morality on a rational foundation. And 
I think this is a great idea if all that it means is that you want a secular, not naturalistic, non-religious uh, story about where morality comes from. But I'm afraid that uh, at least sometimes this is understood or construed in a much narrower way. That is, one, the assumption is that we should think of morality as grounded in reason with a capital R, where this is narrowly construed as in opposition to emotion, affect, um, uh, etc. And of course, there's a very long-standing philosophical uh, tradition of thinking about the origins of morality in this way. Um, Kant uh, uh, it, and, and I suppose Hobbes in some ways would be uh, major figures in this uh, uh, tradition. And uh, I think that this idea of, of putting morality on a rational basis in this uh, narrower sense is um, it's an idea about which I'm pretty skeptical. Uh, I think one of the lessons of recent empirical work is that conscious rational deliberation and rule following is much less central to uh, morality and moral decision making and having a good moral character, et cetera, uh, than many have, have supposed. Instead, things like affect, implicit learning, automatic processing um, are extremely uh, important. We saw this illustrated in the talk we had yesterday about uh, 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 racial and gender prejudice. Um, and I think this is not just an abstract philosophical point, but it bears on the uh, whole question of how we are to address uh, people who uh, uh, hold uh, beliefs or even moral beliefs that we think are misguided in some way. Uh, I think the strategy of trying to change their minds by carefully to explaining to them how stupid and misguided and irrational they are um, is uh, unlikely to be uh, effective if just employed by itself. It's an overly rationalistic strategy. And uh, with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Could you um, also take a pew? Um, oh, sure. Yeah. And we'll um, bring, we up turn Mel, that off and... bring up Mel Connor. What I'm trying to, what I'd like to do this morning, because of the interest of time and the way things tend to happen yesterday, is to just uh, move on to Mel Connor very quickly, and then we've got the three of them together, and we can perhaps have a, a discussion about morality based on that. So, um, do you need to change this? You've got your own things up there. So, M Mel is um, professor of anthropology, neuroscience, and behavioral biology at Emory, um, and author of what is really an absolutely classic text. Um, for those of you who know, it's called The Tangled Wing. Um, one of the people who was going to be here, Robert Sapolsky, um, who is now in the snow somewhere, giving an, um, a convocation address and regretting it deeply, um, <coughs> uh, called The Tangled Wing the nearest, uh, and Mel the nearest thing, the thing we have to a poet laureate of behavioral biology. So, um, poetry from the master. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, by the way, Roger, unlike some noble people who spoke yesterday, I wrote those books for money, among, <laughs> among other reasons. Did, did you, and uh, did you, did I you, have to say I was not successful in attaining ah. that goal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought I was an atheist. And, and then this morning, I went down to the cliffs, and I saw the Pacific Ocean. And I fell to my knees. <laughs> Just kidding. But I, I did notice Darwin's face and the you know foam on the waves. Uh, I um, I've been very interested in what uh, people have had to say at this meeting. But I have to say that, with a few uh, notable exceptions, the the uh, viewpoints have run the gamut from A to B. And uh, I. Uh, I mean, you know, should we bash religion with a crowbar or only with a baseball bat? <laughs> are, are, uh, uh, are people of faith completely out to lunch, or are they just having lunch at their desk and pouring sacramental wine into their keyboards? I mean, it's this, this is about the, uh, uh, the extent of the debate. And uh, so I'm going to try and uh, add something to that. I would, would associate myself with what, uh, uh, with what Jim Woodward just said. <coughs> um, I am a... Uh, Died in the wool faith head, which, uh, using uh, Richard Dawkins' uh, uh, evocative phrase, died in the wool faith head, but um, the wool in my head was was thoroughly and completely bleached uh, in my first semester in college by a, uh, a, a wonderful course in um, 
Anglo-Saxon philosophic analysis, <coughs> um, I got a D plus and the course changed my life. I have, I'm just past my 60th birthday and I have not had a flicker of faith uh, since then. However, um, one of the things I did along the way was go to medical school. I never practiced medicine, but I did have a lot of encounters with patients. And one of the things I was taught was it, it is not the job of the physician to take away the patient's hope. So in the con context was, yes, you tell the truth. I, I'm sorry, sir, but, but you have terminal cancer and uh, you might die next year or the year after. I'm not sure. But no, doc, I think I'm going to be okay. It's going to be fine. Uh, and, and when you have that exchange three times, you stop because it's not the job of the physician to take away the patient's hope. Uh, truth is fine, but you don't have to batter somebody with it. And, and I was happy to hear that, that Richard Dawkins agreed with me. He said he would not tell somebody uh, his views if they were on their deathbed. I find that quite inconsistent, actually. Uh, as many people have pointed out uh, during the meeting, um, we were all on our deathbeds as soon as we attained consciousness of, of the fact that we're going to end up in the same place. Um, and, uh, and I would suggest to you that, that all of you, uh, all of us who, who speak to the public <coughs> about, about science, uh, are physicians in a way, and that it's not the job of the physician to take away the patient's hope. Okay, so <coughs> um, with that as an introduction, uh, this is uh, the, the foundational moment in the religion of my childhood. Uh, the, those are ten, you know, five, last five of the Ten Commandments. Mo the, the expression, this is a Rembrandt, the, the expression on Moses' face is, uh, means um, this is going to be the marketing problem from hell. And the, <laughs> uh, the, the Tenth Commandment, which is very long, uh, is long because it's the one that, that tries to tell you to control your thoughts, and somebody was nervous when they, uh, God was a little nervous when he, when he wrote that one, so he, he made it longer. Uh, that's the one about coveting. <coughs> um, so here's another depiction. Uh, I chose rays coming out of Moses' head. I, I chose this to, uh, to, to remind me to tell you that, that uh, uh, being a member of this group and entails a certain amount of suffering. Uh, I, the, the Hebrew word for rays of light uh, is, is the same as the, the word for horns. Michelangelo uh, depicted Moses with horns. Uh, some very large uh, boys, non-Jewish boys in my neighborhood in Brooklyn <coughs> uh, went looking for my horns from time to time. Uh, and I, I, you know, I understand that religion can do bad things, <coughs> really. Uh, and I, uh, I uh, as for the Holocaust, I, I grew up uh, I learned to talk during the Nuremberg trials. I was told my parents postponed my conception until the closing of the gas chambers. <coughs> uh, I, I grew up with Holocaust survivors around me, uh, even though it was in the United States. And uh, so I'm not going to take a back seat to anybody on Holocaust paranoia. I, I'm going to have a front row seat at the Holocaust paranoia event. <coughs> uh, and I do resent to a certain extent the use of, uh, of Holocaust history to advance a simplistic attack on, on religion. So this is a, a <coughs> from a 17th century uh, Haggadah showing the drowning of Pharaoh's army in the sea, uh, a Christian depiction of the same thing uh, by Lucas Cronach the Elder, 16th century, and a Muslim depiction of the same thing, uh <coughs> uh, 18th century uh, Iran, um, funnily enough. and. Uh, of course, if, uh, if half people in the world uh, believe this, you, you think, well, let's go looking for chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea, and archaeologists have indeed done that, including some very religious ones who very much wanted to find them, and they, uh, ha their search has, uh, has so far been fruitless. Uh, now you can't prove uh, uh, um, th that, that, uh, that it didn't happen, absent... Uh, <coughs> uh, Evidence is not evidence of absence, but uh, we're pretty, I'm on pretty firm ground when I say that that didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, and that's an empirical uh, uh, question. Now, when <coughs> I went to the, uh, um, uh, to the, uh, lived with the Bushman of Botswana, where I was doing research on uh, the hormonal mediation of lactational infertility, among other subjects, uh, I became an apprentice trance dancer. Um, 
And this was after my conversion to, to uh, uh, British philosophy. And I have to say that it didn't uh, entail a change in faith, just a change in behavior. The trans dance, women sit around the fire. This is the morning after an all-night dance. Uh, women sit around the fire, they, they clap and, uh, 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 and sing uh, in sort of yodeling, uh, eerie voices. Uh, men dance around the circle until they go into altered states of consciousness, and then they can heal by laying on hands and going through a particular ritual. I, I, I put this up to show you. Uh, this, this, is a hunting and this was a hunting and gathering society at that time. It, a very fundamental expression of, of, of human r religious uh, uh, <coughs> faith. And uh, they, they uh, were polytheists. They believed in their ancestors were alive. They, when they went into trance, they said that they uh, uh, had gone, afterwards they said they had gone to see their ancestors in, uh, in the, uh, <coughs> the uh, ancestral village, as they call it. And um, I, I just want you to know that I fully respect this, uh, this belief system, uh, although I, as much as I, I do uh, uh, the others that I've mentioned, and, and um, uh, I think that, uh, that there's, it's, it's uh, it shows you how, uh, looking at a system like this shows you how religion uh, fills uh, very basic human needs. And this is what uh, I saw last year when I went back to visit there. Uh, it's very similar uh, uh, trance dance, except that at this point uh, women were the only uh, trance dancers. So that, that's one of the, uh, it's parallel to the change that Richard talked about yesterday in the, in the role of women in, in certain ways in, in uh, our society, but of course it's not like uh, <coughs> the elimination of, of religion. Okay, so <coughs> before I took this uh, philosophy course, I thought <coughs> there were three answers to the question, do you believe in God? Uh, one, <coughs> I believe God exists. Uh, two, I believe God does not exist. Three, I don't know if God exists. But there aren't three, there are four. Uh, I don't understand you, <coughs> is the, the answer that my philosophy professor gave. And that is the first answer that, that I give. Um, if you say, if you then say, when I say, don't, uh, I don't understand you, if you then say, well, um, I mean a guy in the sky who spoke to Moses and, and dictated the Ten Commandments, then I know what to say. Then I say two. Uh, <coughs> that does not exist and did not exist. Uh, it, it, but if you say something like God is love or God is life, or God is the spirit in all things, or you say something vague, uh, uh, vague uh, around that, uh, then I say I don't understand you. So you can think of me as Schrodinger's cat, sort of smeared between two and four, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's where I stand now. And one of the things I accepted after this course was uh, Russell's, what I call Russell's rule, which is better not to believe in things for which there is no evidence. As I believe that very firmly. But as you can see, that's an ought statement. It's an article, in, in that sense, it's an article of faith. Now, I could, I could tell you why I believe that, <coughs> why I think it's a better way to move through the world than a lot of others, but I can't prove it to you. It's, a, it's an ought statement. <coughs> and uh, here's another one from Wittgenstein, <coughs> who famously said of that which we cannot speak, it is best to remain silent. Uh, I haven't seen uh, uh, a lot of evidence uh, uh, of adherence to that in, uh, uh, in the world. But uh, I try, and I, I, I don't always live by it myself, but I try. So here's what Darwin said in The Descent of Man about religion. He, he, sa uh, he said that uh, it was something consisting, highly complicated, consisting of love, complete submission to an exalted and mysterious superior, a strong sense of dependence, fear, reverence, gratitude, hope for the future, and perhaps other elements. Very complicated thing, and it actually, the, the other elements category is probably bigger than, than <coughs> the, the rest of the paragraph. And Darwin wrote to uh, Asa Gray <coughs> in 1860, uh, I feel most strongly that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. The dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. Uh, and um, this is a letter, <coughs> uh, a letter to a, a, a reverend, and, and Darwin did have the habit of being polite to, to folks like that. It's also a letter uh, in which he, uh, he points out that, um, uh, that the habit of economics uh, in in eating caterpillars, live caterpillars from the inside out did not seem to, to be evidence of a beneficent creator. Uh, but uh, uh, he did uh, refuse to um, 
to get involved in, in the uh, conversations about this. So one of the things <coughs> I did after Roger invited me to speak here was um, I bought a stack of books, <coughs> uh, uh, recent books about uh, religion, and uh, I, uh, uh, these, these three books are, um, <coughs> are briefs in favor of, of belief in God. They uh, uh, either repeat old arguments about why God exists uh, or describe um, personal experiences like the one that I uh, didn't have this morning. Uh, and uh, and they're, com they're, they're, they're nice books in a way, but they're completely unconvincing t to me. Uh, Polkinghorn, by the way, has very, a very interesting uh, gambit, which is, seems new. Uh, he takes the God of the gaps idea, <coughs> which has come up, and, uh, and points out that, that now there are two un unfillable, unclosable gaps, uh, and <coughs> one being uh, quantum indeterminacy because of empirical impossibility and, and the other being formal chaos because of uh, technical impossibility of closing the gaps. And he sees God in those unclosed gaps. And what I see there is uh, unclosed gaps and unclose, unclosable gaps. I re agree with that part. <coughs> so here are some books. Uh, uh, the, t the top two, as you know well, are, are on the other side. Uh, I, I think uh, these two uh, books are very similar to the ones in the last slide in that they are briefs for a particular point of view. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, and that's, that's fine. Uh, they are, they are uh, impertinent and, and impolite, which is great. Uh, but actually, they're also intemperate. And that's not so good because it kind of makes you less logical. Um, for example, let's say you had a hypothesis that, uh, that religion has done much more harm than good in the world. How would you go about testing that? Well, you would, you would want to jeopardize it, or at least you would want to, to marshal the evidence of, of the harm and then marshal the evidence of the good. But these two books only marshal the evidence of the, of the harm. Let me give you an analogy, which is a bad analogy, but, but suppose I... I I really uh, want, really want to make money on a book. I write a book uh, about water with a chapter on tsunamis, a chapter on hurricanes, a, a chapter on the fact that, that almost all the water in the world is salty and poisonous to humans, and then said water, water's a bad thing. Well, uh, that's the method. This is, not, this is not a good analogy, but that's the method that's taken uh, in these two books. Uh, Sam's book is also, <coughs> and you can, read, you can read the review by of Richard's book by Terry Eagleton, which uh, will tell you more about why I think what I think about it. Uh, S Sam's book is in what I would call the, the chicken little uh, genre of, of uh, attacks on religion. We're going to, uh, uh, to face the worst uh, consequences in the history of the world. How, how anybody, uh, uh, if we don't get rid of religion, how anybody could, could look at the 20th century, where, by the way, um, only a, only a fraction of the scores of millions of, of violent deaths are attributable to, to religion. Um, I, 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 I don't know, but <coughs> uh, and, and say that the that 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 the worst is uh, is going to come from religion. I, I think it shows a a, a failure to take a balanced uh, view of, of what has happened in history uh, and, and a lack of interest as as. Uh, as Jim pointed out in, in evidence. <coughs> and in really, I, I'm now, I'm not saying that the conclusions that, that are drawn in these two books would not be confirmed by, by appropriate uh, scientific methods. I'm just saying that, uh, that they weren't taken and that, uh, <coughs> um, that for them to be uh, the, in the vanguard of the scientific approach to, to uh, t talking with religious people in the world, uh, it's about as, as, as far away from the right approach uh, uh, as you can get, in my opinion. Dan Dennett <coughs> also has a lot of snide uh, uh, remarks to make about religion, but, but uh, he is actually interested in, in, in evidence. He, doesn't, he, he talks about the different categories of evidence for, for, the, uh, uh, for, for the way religion works and the, and the harm and good it does, um, <coughs> but he doesn't... Um, uh, he doesn't uh, uh, 
refrain from bashing religion too, which which is okay. But but and by the way, if you haven't read his wonderful letter that's on on the table outside, he wrote a, a letter of, from what what will, could easily have been his deathbed to all of us, basically <coughs> uh, uh, about the experiences he had and. Uh, there are no surprises, but it's a very <laughs> eloquent and, and, and good thing. I, ur I urge you to read it. Uh, and uh, Steve Gould's book, Rocks of Ages, uh, is something that um, I, I can't endorse either. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why a little later. Uh, so after reading these, uh, uh, these polemics, by the way, I have, I have, after, after saying negative things about Joan's uh, book, I have to say that it's gracefully written and that she is a paragon of courage for coming into this den of vipers and, and uh, trying to <laughs> present a religious viewpoint. Uh, so I went to my own bookshelf and found these uh, and dusted them off and, uh, and read them. And I cannot tell you uh, what a relief it was to to read calm, reasoned uh, argument about complex subjects that that truly uh, address the issues in a balanced way. And by the way, come to the conclusion that you know either either two or four in my list of positions on God is 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 right. Uh, <coughs> and I suggest that, that that as for as for convincing people that that uh, that their religious convictions. The people who are on the borderline or the people who are susceptible to being convinced, uh, if you want to convince them um, what, why they uh, shouldn't believe, I would recommend these books <coughs> uh, first. So if this book works, this is a quotation from The God Delusion, as I intend religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. And, what and this is the next line, what presumptuous optimism, of course, died in the wool faith heads are immune to argument, of course, uh, immune. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why I, uh, uh, I succumbed to the arguments of my philosophy professor, I suppose, this died in the wool faith heads are immune to argument. But at any rate, um, and this is from the end of faith, the Sam's book, the days of our religious identities are clearly numbered. So delusion, as defined by <laughs> DSM, <laughs> a false belief based on incorrect inference about external reality that is firmly sustained despite what almost everybody else believes. So that, that is uh, certainly one part of delusion. And to be fair, Richard says this is not the definition of delusion that he wants to use. He wants to use the, the dictionary def the definition uh, of delusion, um, which is a false belief or impression, and uh, you know, by that definition, we've all had at least six delusions before breakfast today. <laughs> uh, but it, it does, and, and Sam and, and Richard's books don't meet the next criterion um, because there is no incontrovertible and obvious proof or evidence to the to uh, t to support the existence of God. But uh, you notice that that psychiatrists have explicitly said. Uh, that uh, articles of religious faith don't count. Now, <coughs> look, look at these two statements and uh, ask yourself, you know, which, is, which more closely fulfills the, the, the definition, the technical definition of delusion, uh, and it's clearly these statements and not uh, the statement, I believe in God. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about this. This is the standard... <coughs> uh, uh, arguments against belief, <coughs> they are numerous, they are convincing. Every one, one of them is, is, is endorsed by me uh, as I stand here. Um, and, uh, and I think there are a lot of interesting, um, uh, there's a lot of interesting things say to, to, to say about each of them. Uh, then you have uh, the, the explanations for religion that are, that are psychological and psychosocial, and I also thoroughly endorse those. And you have uh, uh, and so the, the belief in God uh, it, it, it draws on certain psychological uh, needs and yearnings of, and, and other aspects of religion draw on other aspects. Uh, and furthermore, <coughs> I agree uh, with Richard and, uh, and Sam that all sacred texts are characterized by errors and lies, internal and mutual contradictions. Uh, uh, implausible supernatural origins and silly or cruel behavior of gods and religious heroes. Now, I show you these, this list because I want to tell you 
that if, if, um, if you're having trouble remembering the, the conversations that you had late at night in your college dormitory then you sh you about these things, then you should uh, by all means go out and do what I did and spend a couple of hundred bucks on, uh, on a stack of books attacking religion because it will refresh your, your memory of those conversations very well, but uh, y you won't find out anything new. <coughs> so taking these objections, we need to recognize that none of them is new. Uh, all have, have been heard or independently thought of by most intelligent people. And most important, none has posed or is likely to pose a serious obstacle to belief in the minds of the vast majority of believers. How can that be? Well, once upon a time, there were major religious leaders who thought they could explain how the physical world works. They also cared a lot about proofs of God's existence. But thanks to Galileo and all, these people have been in retreat for four centuries. But most religious people don't care about proofs. It's not news to them that religion has caused great harm it's, or that sacred texts are flawed or that science explains most things. They have been meeting those objections with aplomb for centuries. Most don't care. <coughs> they will proudly tell you about argument. They don't care about evidence. They don't even care that they can't clearly define God. Most